Well, good morning, and welcome to our live-streamed worship service at Faith Evangelical Free Church, where our vision is to declare the Word of God and disciple believers into mature and devoted followers of Jesus. In just a moment, we'll begin our worship service together in song, prayer, fellowship, and the Word of God. But before we do that, can I invite you to join us in person soon? There are many reasons to stream a service from home, and we understand that. Sometimes it's just necessary. And on those days, we, we pray that God uses this stream to keep you close to him through his word. But everything about worshiping God is better together in person with the congregation. There aren't enough microphones in the world for me to convey the power of singing with the congregation to you. And that's just one example of the many I could give. In Psalm 42, David longs for the Lord like a deer longs for flowing streams of water. And as his spirit is cast down within himself, he remembers singing with the congregation, and it gives him hope. In a similar way, the body of Christ is given to us for our encouragement and our hope. Do not neglect what God gives you for your good. But even while you're away, and again, we understand that sometimes this must happen, you can still connect with us by texting Faith Connect, all one word, all lowercase, to 970-000, and we'll send you a link to our online connect card. In the same way, you can text Faith Give, all lowercase, all one word, and we'll send you a link to our online giving portal. And at any time, you can text 970-000 with whatever message you have, and we'll respond to you as we're able. Thank you again for joining us for our live streamed worship service at Faith Evangelical Free Church. May God bless you as you give him the praise due his name. Let's sing. He's risen, and we are his people. Let's sing.
saints and glorify our God, the Father of our Lord. In Christ he has in heavenly realms his blessings on us all. For pure and thankless in his sight he destined us to be. And now we've been adopted through his Son eternally. To the praise of your glory, to the praise of your mercy and grace, to the praise of your glory, you are the God who saves. Come praise and glorify our God who gives his grace in Christ. Our sins are washed away, redeemed through sacrifice. In Him, God has made known to us the mystery of His will, that Christ should be the head of all His purpose to fulfill. To the praise of your glory. proof text for a greet your neighbor moment in the sermon or in the service rather but I I can't think of a better way I'm sure I could lots of good ways but that's a really good way to greet one another to welcome one another by singing the very words of scripture you sang Ephesians 1 to declare that our God the God who has called us together to gather is a God who saves all to say come praise and glorify together with us this morning. What a call to worship. Amen? Amen and amen and welcome to Faith Evangelical Free Church. That's our call to worship. If you've been part of this fellowship for 50 years, that's the call if you've never even considered yourself a Christian before. Come today, now, and give God the glory. For he is a God who saves 
One of the simplest ways to give God the glory, my friends, is to give God the first place in your wallet. Really smooth transition. Did you feel it? I planned that. It's in my notes. But sincerely, it has been a long time since I reminded you that our offering slots are under the balcony stairs in the back. Those are there so that you can worship God through giving. They're there for you. They're not there for us. Just as we provide for singing and prayer and scripture reading and preaching to lead you all in worship, we also provide a way for you to worship God with your finances through giving. It's there for you. It's an act of worship on your part to say that God's ongoing, ongoing glory, I almost said ongoing glory, that's not right, ongoing glory in the growth of a local church's mission is worthy of your very best and your first. Barnabas, that son of encouragement, sold a field that was his inheritance and laid the proceeds at the disciples' feet to meet the needs of the congregation. The Philippians made sure that the Apostle Paul was well supplied for his gospel work. Love for the brothers and love for the gospel is what motivates our giving. So come praise and glorify our God together who saves. A few other announcements for us as we continue our time in worship. The first is IFASUD, which stands for International Farmers Organization for a Sustainable Development. If you didn't catch that, it's online at info.faithfree.com. There's going to be more of that. Hope you're awake. The Missions Committee invites you to an informational meeting with IFASUD to learn more about their ministry. It's a Christian nonprofit in Haiti that aims to alleviate poverty among farmers through training farming skills, but they use that opportunity to share the gospel with them and to disciple them at the same time. It's an interesting ministry with a unique opportunity. You can sign up at faithfree.com to come and learn more about it. It's on May 5th at 6.30 p.m. My next announcement is the directory. Oh, oh, the glories of a church directory, right? But you can update your information anytime at info.faithfree.com. And it's an important part of our ministry. It really is. It's a huge help. We're not a massive church, right? But we're not a small church either, and the directory is a really practical way that we work to equip one another for the work of the ministry. It helps newcomers put faces to names with your profile picture. Helps you look up the guy you met in the foyer to invite him out for lunch this week. You can get an address for a friend who's grieving, so you can send them a card. All of that stuff, of all places, is in the directory at info.faith3.com. Info.faith3.com is more than just sign-ups for stuff. It really is. Here's its tagline. I'm sorry, this is cheesy. It's everything you need all in one place. With that out of the way, let's turn now and bow our hearts before the Lord in a time of prayer. Well, Father, we come into your presence with singing, with glad hearts and thanksgiving, worshiping you for all that you've done in Christ Jesus, our Lord. For you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in him. In him. Just as he died, we so die with him. Just as he was raised. And so we are raised. And now he sits at your right hand. And our life is hidden with you in him. He is high and lifted up. And worthy, 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 worthy of all of our praise. For he is God, and there is none like you in all the earth. But you've commanded us, Father. You've commanded us and encouraged us and strengthened us by your Spirit to come before you in prayer, to cry, Abba, Father, like beloved children, to imitate you, to be conformed to the image of your Son, and to speak with you freely. Jesus did, and we should too. And so we bring all of our concerns and all of our cares, the things that weigh us down and distract us from the truth, the things that tempt us towards what is wrong, whatever they may be, Lord, uh, we all come now silently before you. Just bear our burdens in your presence. Please hear our cares.
Father, if we begin with our load of sin, please forgive us. Please remove far from us any guilt. Please disentangle our feet from those things which so easily trip us up. And forgive us. Forgive us. We've heard of your greatness. We've beheld your love. And yet we still return to our sin foolishly. We need your help. We need your grace. We need your mercy. Oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, turn and forgive. There are many in our fellowship, Lord, who we know are, are going through difficulties of various kinds. I think of the Anderson family, John and Amy, Laura and Carl, as they lose loved ones and walk alongside those who suffer. We celebrate with Matt and Emily for their newborn Jesse. So much joy, Father. Strengthen them to parent and parent well. And raise Jesse by your own power and wisdom and instruction of the Lord through his parents. We lift up various pains, ongoing medical difficulties like Shirley's back or Robin Matson's ongoing cancer treatment. We think of those in our midst who, who work in the agricultural field this time of year. There's much to prepare for, and yet so much not in their control. Teach them to wait upon the Lord, to trust in your name, to look to the heavens more than more readily than the watchman waits from, for the morning. Think of students as they finish their, their year, help them to finish strong, help them not to give up and punt at the end, but to persevere, to study well. Think of those among us who are considering marriage in various ways. Humble them. Reveal to them the depth of your love and your mercy in Christ Jesus as they consider what it is to reflect his grace. We pray for families expecting children and for those longing to expect children. Remember them in your mercy. Forget them not. Strengthen them by your care. And we think too, Father, of, of parents preparing their children for maturity. They'd be ready for adulthood. And the anxiety that can grow as the time slips away so quickly. Give parents of nearly grown children the, the faith to believe that you are sovereign over every detail, present, past, and future. You've numbered every day, even the ones that are yet ahead. And by your word and your spirit's power, give them strength for tomorrow. Help us all today, Father, to look with eyes of faith and behold the greatness of your Son, and then to be so moved to consider it deeply in ourselves to really process its truth, come to grips with the facts of the world that you sent your Son in the likeness of human flesh to die in our place for sin. It's no small thing. Help us to meditate on it long and hard. And then as we go, strengthen us, Father, please, to speak of this Jesus freely, for he really is who he says he is, and everything he said was true. Free us from lethargy or cowardice, strengthen us with boldness. But all of those things, Father, come from nothing less, we pray, than our love for Christ and the truth of his word. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Would you take your Bibles with me now and turn to the book of 2 Peter? As we continue our readings in the book of 2 Peter, devoting ourselves to the public reading of Scripture and the whole counsel of God, we just read verse by verse by verse. I hope you're all here in three years when we finally get to the details of Ezekiel, as we read through the whole counsel of God together. But for now, for now we're in 2 Peter chapter 1. In verse 16, Peter's addressing a, a church and reminding them of where the truth in which they stand has come from. And he says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he, that is Jesus, for when Jesus received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven. These things are true, right? This very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, by which you can see, right? Pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along, borne by the Holy Spirit. It's the word of the Lord. Now as we come to hear more from the word of God, would you stand with us? Let's sing and commit ourselves to waiting upon the Lord and hearing his voice when he speaks. Let's sing. Yes. I call to you, Lord, hear me from on high, and give attention to my voice when I former. I cry to you in darkest places I will call incline your ear to me anew and hear my cry for mercy Lord were you to count my sinful ways how could your hope in God
Often forget how big this pulpit is. Can you see me actually? Do you? I feel so insignificant behind this pulpit. Uh, dear brothers and sisters, we're going to open up the scriptures in John 6 and going to pick off where Jason left off uh, last week. Him and I decided for the time that he's on uh, some family vacation to uh, preach through John chapter 6, very monumental passage in uh, John's gospel. And this, of course, uh, follows what Jason preached on last week, the feeding of the 5,000. And we're going to pick up there in verse 15. I'm going to ask God to grace our time here together and uh, ask him to... uh, Just open the word for us. Uh, Heavenly Father, I pray that you will give us clarity to the meaning of Scripture, what you intended it to say to us. May God, we not only hear, but may we introspectively process and apply the word as needed. May we not leave today the mirror of Scripture and be forgetful yours. I pray that you will guide me, that you give me clarity of speech. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of my message today is Christos Pantocrator. And you're like, what's this all about? Just hang in there. Um, I'm a, I like art. I enjoy going to art galleries. And I remember the catacombs in, in Rome where I could see early artwork of Christianity. Very, very amazing. And there's one portraying a picture of Christians being persecuted. And there's a picture of Christ being the Good Shepherd. Beautiful picture. But starting in the 4th century, all through the Middle Ages, Christian artists portrayed Jesus as Christos Pantocrator. Pantocrator or Pantocrator, it depends where you grew up, is literally translated from two Greek words, all plus mighty. Christ, the almighty one, the all-powerful Christ, ruler of all. These paintings often depict Jesus as one who draws the circle of the earth and measures the depths of the ocean. This was the case all through the ages, but by the time of the Renaissance, Jesus is portrayed as an infant sitting on his mother's lap. Just a change in culture as picked up by the artist. Artists are very good at portraying what culture thinks and what churches think. As we look at John 6, the gospel writer is portraying Jesus as Christos Pantocrator, Christ the almighty, the all-powerful ruler of all things. And John paints a picture here for us. It's a very dramatic scene, two scenes, one on a mountain that is unshakable, one man, one unshakable mountain, and then a group of men 
on a stormy sea, a very contrasting picture. Let us read from verse 15 and John 6. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because of a strong wind blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. And they were frightened. But Jesus said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. What a dramatic story. And at several points through this portion of Scripture, John is making several connections to the Old Testament, uh, reminiscent of, of Moses in the wilderness and the manna, the preceding context, the, the feeding of the 5,000. John connects Jesus with the prophecy given to Moses in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, where it speaks about this prophet, this, this coming prophet, a better Moses. And this better Moses will be a prophet. And they are told that the people must listen to his voice. And no doubt, they conclude that Jesus is the prophet prophesied about in Deuteronomy 18. Look at verse 14. He says, Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he performed, they said, This is truly the prophet, speaking of the Deuteronomy 18 prophet, who is to come into the world. And the way that, that John is structuring these stories for us, he connects us with the Old Testament. And he is going to do the same in this dramatic display on the Sea of Galilee. There's many Old Testament connections. In fact, the passage really comes to life once we uh, see these connections. Look at John 6.20. I'm just orientating you through the passage here. John uh, uh, 6.20, it says, But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. That phrase is anchored in the Old Testament. We can think of Genesis 17.1, where where God appears to a very fearful Abraham, and, and he says to Abraham, I am God Almighty. I am El Shaddai. I am the Mighty One, and he calms Abraham's fears. Yahweh appears to Moses on Mount Horeb, and likewise comforts Moses, telling him to say to the Israelites that I am sent you. I am is the memorial name of God, Exodus 3.15. Yahweh says to the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 41.13, For I am the Lord your God, who upholds your right hand, who says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. And once again, the very presence of the I am sends this message, do not be afraid. John deliberately connects divine attributes with Jesus. He takes the attributes 
of Yahweh, God Almighty, El Shaddai, the great I Am, and he connects it here with Jesus in John 6 very powerfully. And in fact, uh, this entire section of John 6 cannot be unhitched from the Old Testament. John did not sip such Kool-Aid as to separate the Old Testament from the New Testament. Neither should we. And so as we study this passage, I want to show you three divine attributes displayed in Christ, and how John connects it is very comforting to us. You know, we all know from a very young age the three O's, omnipresence, omnipotence, and omniscience. We know that. And I would say to you, so what? Whoopee, what does that mean? What does that mean to us practically? And John will show us that this is what it means for us very practically, especially when we are in chaos in life. In fact, John 6 is a story of how Christ brought calm to chaos. And he connects it with the attributes of God. And the three ways in which he connects these attributes is, one, omniscience is connected with intercession. Omnipotence is connected with comfort and consolation. And omnipresence is connected with redemption. I'm going to work through each one of these. But, but I hope you will leave here today thinking about the attributes of God. Christ, the divine attributes, in a different way, and that they are very practical and very comforting to us when our lives are somewhat in chaos. When I counsel uh, people, I often bring in the attributes of Christ, the divine attributes, to comfort people. They're very reassuring. So let's see how John connects the the different attributes. The first one is the omniscience of Christ, and he connects that with prayer and intercession. Look at verses, six, uh, verses 15 to 18. There in John 6, he says, So Jesus perceiving, Jesus perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Now, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, and after getting into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. He had not yet come to them. The sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. Chaos is breaking out here. The scene is becoming more and more chaotic, and Jesus is not with them. Jesus is where? He's up on a mountain. What is he doing on top of a mountain, you would say? We'll see what he does a little later on. What is he doing on the mountain? But for now, the divine attribute of omniscience is becoming very clear because it says there that he is perceiving the intentions of the heart. They're not saying and blabbering, you're, we want to make you king, we want to make you king. He is sensing it because he knows the hearts and minds of human beings. This is not the first time we read about this. In Luke 5.22, he says to the Jews, why are you reasoning in your hearts? In the Bible, whenever it speaks about the heart, it speaks about the human mind. And so Jesus knows what's on our minds. He knows it, and he knows it perfectly. And one author says, his supernatural knowledge of their inten intentions to make him king is clear to Jesus. It is clear to him what their intentions are, and they haven't even acted on it. John is probably thinking of Psalm 139, verse 2. You know when I sit down, and you know when I rise up, you understand my thought from afar. Jesus knows our thoughts from afar. He knows every intention of our hearts from a distance. Why? 
He's omniscience because of his omniscience. He knows the darkest thoughts in everyone's hearts here today. And yet he shows himself kind of benevolent. He knows what you're thinking. And he shows himself kind of benevolent. Look at verse 15 there. He withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Very emphatic. What is he doing on the mountain? Have you thought about that? Somebody says praying. You're absolutely right. Just like Moses retreated to the mountain to be with God, so Jesus retreated to be with God. A parallel account is Mark 6, 46. He says there, after bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. So we know for a fact he was up on the mountain praying. But at this point, his disciples left the safety of the shoreline of Bethsaida, and they started uh, rowing across the Sea of Galilee to the west, to Capernaum, about five or six miles as the crow flies. Capernaum means village of consolation or village of grace. They were going from Bethsaida to the village of grace all alone by themselves, Jesus on the mountain, and they are now on a stormy sea. Darkness overcame the disciples. The winds were blowing from the mountains. The journey has become precarious. Verse 17 says, it had already become dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. It's dark. Where is Jesus? He always, he's got to be here with us. We need him. He's on a mountain all by himself. What is he doing? He's interceding for them. Dear brothers and sisters, do we not at times have a similar experience? We feel things are chaotic. Uh, it has become dark into our, in our lives. And where is Jesus? We can't find him. We've prayed, we've opened our Bibles, and we're growing nervously impatient. Where is Jesus? Has he forgotten about us? But Matthew Henry says of this passage, he says, they were Christ's disciples and were now in the way of their duty, and Christ was now on the mountain praying for them. And yet they were in his distress. In, and yet they were in this distress. The perils and afflictions of this present time may very well consist with our interest in Christ and his intercession. How can Christ intercede for us properly? He can only do that if he knows everything perfect. For all we know, he could be facing the other direction. They are to his back. He's on a mountain. They're on a stormy sea. It's dark. They didn't have lights on the boats. He doesn't even see them. And yet he knows, and he intercedes. He knows everything. He knows everything perfect. He knows of the drama unfolding on the Sea of Galilee, and he knows perfectly how to pray for them. Christ has perfect knowledge of all things at all time, and he knows everything, and he uses that knowledge for the benevolence and benefits of his beloved saints. Romans 8.34 Romans 8, 34. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised. And who is at the right hand of God. Who also intercedes for us. God, Jesus knows God perfectly. And Jesus knows us perfectly. And therefore, he can intercede for us. At the throne of God. Christ, in fact 
continuously makes intercession for us as believers before the Father. Even when we think he does not know about our situation, maybe even before you and I think of praying, Jesus is already praying for us, interceding for us. And we might think it is dark and Jesus has not come yet to our rescue. He is at work. He is at work ceaselessly praying for us. I find this thought mind-blowing. He knew perfectly what was in the minds of the disciples, and no doubt they had some weird thoughts about Jesus. Maybe they even wanted to make him king by force, right? Who knows? And yet, he intercedes for them. It says in Hebrews 7.27, Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always loves to make intercessions for them. Who is the them? The saints. There is no doubt that as Jesus is interceding, praying, at the same time, he is controlling the raging winds and the billowing waves. But Jesus will soon come to their aid. One author says, the Son of God who made the world was in control of all the forces of nature. And in this case, he will soon suspend the law of gravity. Look at verse, 16, uh, verse 18 to 20. The sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. Then when they had rowed about three or four miles, now think of this, three or four miles, the wind blowing, the, these guys are no doubt off course. The entire lake has a surface area of 84 square miles. 84 square miles, that's a lot of real estate, right? I try to calculate this with my, my limited abilities of math. I did not do well at school. In math, but I, I, I figure it is about a 12 square mile area that they potentially could be in. It's dark. The waves are all over the place. And Jesus sets a course for them. How did he find them? He's like, where are you? I don't get the picture that he's like, okay. He's not succumbing to the waves. He's not fighting the waves. He's not fighting the wind. Look at verse 19. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. This is like a green way. He's like in spring. He's like just walking. And he drew near to the boat. And you would think that they're like, whoa, great news. Jesus is here. But what is happening? They were frightened. You, you think they'll be freaked out by the waves and the wind? They freaked out. Jesus is coming to them. What a powerful display of what? Not only omniscience, you knew where to find them because you knew exactly where they were. This is a display of divine omnipotence. Here's the creator, a Christos Pentecrator, suspending the laws of gravity. And it comes... And it brings comfort and consolation. Jesus walks out on the water. He's not straining himself. The winds and the waves are not opposing him. The darkness of night is not confusing him. He walks straight up to the boat. Because he's Christos, Pantocrator. He is Christ the Almighty, and they were frightened. This next scene developing here displays divine omnipotence, but it captures this moment here of the omnipotent one bringing comfort and consolation. 
there's something to be said here of fear, and a rightful fear. God is not tame. He is not tame. He's a lion, but he's good. And then he says to them, it is I, in verse 20, this is a culminating verse here. He said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Now, now we got to slow down here. This is very, very amazing. And, and, and I got kind of excited about this, okay? Because what Jesus is literally saying here is, I am. Fear not. I am, fear not. You can go online to these interlinear Bibles. You can check the Greek and the English is below that. Take my word for it. He is saying, I am, fear not. Or stop fearing. He doesn't say, hey dude, it's me. Hey, chill out, I'm here. He's saying, I am, fear not. He is intentionally using a very familiar Old Testament phrase. I am, fear not. They, they like, whoa, didn't, didn't Yahweh say that to Abraham? Did Yahweh not say that to Moses? I am, fear not. Genesis 26, 25. Genesis, 20, Genesis 26, 25, the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not fear. I am with you. I am plus fear not. Exodus three fourteen. God says to Moses, Moses is like intimidated. He's like, yeah, the, I'm scared. These people are going to just kick me out. These Israelites, they 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 difficult people. And God says to him, I am who I am. John's gospel is saturated with these I am statements. There's, there's numerous of these, these I am statements. John 18, verse 6, is probably the culminating of those statements. What happened in John 18, 6? The arrest of Jesus. A mob comes, and they, they come to arrest Jesus. And, and, they, and they say to Jesus, are, 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 are you Jesus? Let me take you there. It's very cool. John 18, 16. 18, 6, sorry, 18, 6. Thought for a moment, somebody retyped my Bible. <laughs> so when he said to them, I am he. See that he is italics? Means it's not in the original language. What's there in the original language is I am. And Judas also was betraying me, was standing there. Okay, so he says to them, I am. And what happens? They drew back and they fell to the ground. Because for a moment there he displayed himself as El Shaddai, Yahweh, God Almighty. A great display of omnipotence. But it's a comforting thing for his people. Omnipotence, divine omnipotence, should scare the daylights out of the unbeliever. But for the believer, it says, fear not. Fear not. How many irrational fears do we not have on an ongoing basis? People fear. People fear to the extent that they do not even want to leave their homes. 
The NIH says that up to 31% of Americans experience at some point in life some form of anxiety or panic or fear disorder, which leaves them incapacitated. There are no doubt many Christians who have an excessive fear about life in general. They lack peace, they lack joy, because they succumb to relentless fear, worry, and concern about just about everything. And yet, Jesus is greater and more powerful than anything we can fear. Think of your worst fear. Think of it for a moment. What's your worst fear? Okay, Jesus is bigger than that. Jesus is bigger than that. He is all-powerful. I mean, that's cool. You know, this is almost like a movie, right? It's like you know, guys are shaking and they're fearing, and here comes Arnold Schwarzenegger in his good old days and punches. You know, Jesus is just powerful. And, and, and no matter what the fear, he's bigger than that. We, we as Christians, we, we really need to think about anxiety, fear, and worry in terms of divine omnipotence. The fact that we are God's beloved people, we should not fear anything. 1 John 4, 18 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect fear casts, sorry, erase. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. We are perfectly loved by Christ. We ought not to fear. Romans 8.15 says, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. Why do we not fear anything? Look, if you fear something, just remember, there's one who you have to fear, that is God. Because he is almighty God. All-powerful God. And yet, Romans 8.15 says, we call him what? Abba, Father. At this moment, back to the, the drama on the Sea of Galilee. The waves, the wind, the darkness, worn out. I mean, I've not rowed for three or four miles. I don't think I've ever done that. But, but when I'm at the rower there at the at the gym, that tires me. So these guys are tired, they're worn out, and here comes Jesus. And he tells them not to fear. That reminds us of Isaiah 41.10. Maybe that's what John had in mind. Isaiah 41.10. Do not fear, for I am is with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The only reason why that boat did not sink was because he held that boat in his right hand. Jesus is the all-powerful and almighty Pantocrator. And therefore, you, brothers and sisters, like the disciples, we should take comfort at that the omnipotent one, the all-powerful one, is with you. Oh, for a thousand tongues we sing. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease, this music to the sinner's ears, it's life and health 
and peace. If Christ is for us, nothing can be against us. So what have we learned this far? Hopefully we've learned two things. Christ is omniscient because he knows everything perfectly. He can intercede for us. Number two, he is omnipotent. And because he's all-powerful, nothing can go against him. Nothing can work him over. He is all-powerful. And therefore, we can draw great comfort and calm from this. But here's one more thing I want to share with you. Hope we've got enough time. And this is the very fact that Christ is omnipresent. He is the very present help in all our trouble. Look at verse 21. And this is where our minds are going to be stretched a little bit, I hope. Verse 21, so they were willing to receive him into the boat. They were willing to receive him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. You think that's fast, okay? Star Trek, warp speed. It's faster than warp speed. When the Mandalorian, what does he go through? Warp speed or... We say that, Trudy, are you watching Mandalorian? I thought I heard you say that. But, but the Mandalorian is fast. When he hits that button, this is faster than warp speed. It's like immediately. Okay, what is going on here? Is this a spelling error? Is this a translational error? Think of how this could have played out. The disciples recognized Jesus, but now they freaked out. He says to them, don't freak out, I'm here. Okay, I am. I am who I am. They're comforted and they consult and they're like, oh, okay. And they invite him on the boat. Now, what John doesn't tell us here is that the sea was calm. He doesn't tell us that. But what does he say to us? The boat gets in an instant where it was supposed to go. I think that is monumental. Because in Christ's omnipresence, he is able to rescue and redeem. For John, The greater miracle was probably not the calming of the sea or the wind in an instant. What was the greater miracle for John here was that Jesus rescued them and brought them home safely. He brought them to the village of comfort and grace. The NIV, I just thought, let's check another translation just in case I'm not reading this right. The NIV says, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. So, these are puzzling words. And whenever there's puzzling words in the Bible that stretches our intellectual abilities and our understanding of science and physics, all of a sudden, a lot of Bible commentators, there's crickets. I'm like, I'm reading one Bible commentary after another, and it's like silence. It's like, why are you not explaining to me what happened here? Well, you got to go to the old and the dead guys. So I went to this guy, uh, John Gill. He was a predecessor to uh, Charles Spurgeon. He was there before Spurgeon uh, got to Spurgeon's church. And, And he says this, For not only the wind ceased, but another miracle was wrought. The ship was in an instant at a place whither they intended to go. 
God got them where they, where they were supposed to go. Jesus got them where they were supposed to go. And it was not row, row, row your boat. It was warp speed. Faster than you and I can say, bada bing, they were at their intended destination. This miracle, this particular miracle, obviously confounded John the disciples, and even the masses who were following Jesus. Because we read, and I will tell you the next part of the story next week, but in verse 25, everybody is baffled as to how they, he got there. they like, you did not get in the boat. Did you take a jet ski over there? No, jet skis weren't invented yet. So you couldn't have jet skied over there. Everybody's confounded. How did he get there? What does this say? Jesus is omnipresent. And I, I can't explain this. I'm sorry. He's omnipresent. I, I'll read to you what R.C. Sproul says. Just take it or leave it. I, I, I mean, what, what's happening here is what Jesus is not limited by geographical obstacle. He is not limited by the forces of nature. He is not bound by space and time. And he really is not bothered by the laws of physics. If these things could work against him, he could not rescue and redeem. He, 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 he could have, it's like, well, well, you know, you know we, we, we died. Unfortunately, I could not rescue you because the ways were so rough. I just couldn't get here in time. If Jesus says he can rescue us and redeem us, he needs to be able to get us out in the moment. Star Trek, beam me up. Right? If that's what it takes, that's what it's, taking, it's going to take. But let, let's see how R.C. Sproul explains this. He says, the person of Christ is still a perfect union of a divine nature and a human nature. The divine nature is not limited to the physical confines of the body of Jesus. Okay. The divine nature retains its property of omniscience. The person of Christ can be everywhere. But that ability is through the power of the divine nature, not the human nature. Okay. You want me to read that again? It just says, Jesus is omnipresent. The divine nature retains its property of omnipresence. It wasn't, yeah, I, I, I got to stop here. I can't explain this, but they got to where they needed to be, and he got them there. I think this remarkable display of Christ's omnipresence reaches back to Psalm 46. Very well-known psalm, Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in our trouble. He is here. He's here. He's there. He's out, he, he's out there. He, he is there with a... The people are being persecuted for their faith. He is there where people are just sleeping still. He is there. And he can rescue them any moment, any, 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 any opportunity. He can rescue because he can be there. Isaiah 43, 1 says, But now, thus says the Lord, your creator, O God. Creator, O God. He says, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Really cool. He was there. He was there, and he got them out of the mess. I wonder if the boat landed like on the beach. I wondered if they just appeared in Capernaum. And they're like, whoa, where did you guys come from? You know, I don't know. I mean, just let your imaginations go there for a moment. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. The Holy One of Israel, your Savior. This idea that Jesus can be anywhere and God can be anywhere means that he can rescue us anywhere, anytime, any moment. He can redeem us. If he, if he wasn't omnipresent, he can't say that. 
And so Jesus and his disciples were snatched from the storm. Bada bing. And they appeared in the village of comfort and grace. There's a lot here, my friends, and I don't want to elaborate too much on this, but the moment that they were willing to receive Jesus in the boat, the problem were over. And that word receive, I'm not sure if that's actually in the ESV. It says they welcomed him in the ESV. NSB says received. Very strong word, received. Receiving Jesus means to receive him in a relational way as Lord and Savior. John 1, 12. As many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. Instant. You receive him, instant. He is there. He is with you. Lo, I'm with you. Even to those who believe in his name. So when they received him, there was an element of faith there when they received him. There's far more to this word spiritually, receive him, than meets the eye. But nevertheless, they received Jesus. They received him as Christos Pantocrator. But he also received him at some point as the one who would die on the cross and rise from the dead three days later. Jesus brought them home safely despite the storms of life. My friend, if you receive Jesus in the boat of your life, no matter how stormy it is, your boat may be ready to sink. Your solution is what? Receive Jesus. Receive Jesus. How many, how many Christians, they, how many people I meet, they, they're, they, they're like, you got to sink. You got to sink. But they're not going to receive Jesus in the boat of their lives. They would rather let the boat of their lives sink in their storms than receive Jesus. Why? Because we want to be captain of our own boats. We don't want to have him at the helm. Here's a beautiful reminder of Jesus as the one who rescues. Second Timothy 4.18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. He will rescue me from every evil deed. Why? Because he's there. You call on him, he's ready to rescue. And he will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. Safely. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let me say this to you. When things can get really, really bad, like really, really bad, Jesus can receive you in his kingdom quicker than you and I can say, bada bing. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. And those alive will be caught up or snatched up with them to meet the Lord in the air and we shall always be with Him. The moment you close your eyes, if you receive Jesus, bada bing, you're safely home. Let's say you were alive, and, he, and it's at this point in the, in the end times, and we're alive, and it's getting really, really bad. Bada bing! Hey, Jesus! Whew, am I glad to see you. He could snatch you up. If he could get the boat three miles across in an instant, he can get you in heaven. Instant. Whether you're alive or dead, he can. Why? He's Christos Pantocrator. So, the winds of change and the storms of life are going to break out at some point in your life, my friend. But think of Jesus as Pantocrator. One, because he is omniscient. He is omniscient and he can intercede and mediate for you. Number two, because Christ is omnipotent, he can console and comfort you. And number three, because he's omnipresent, he can redeem and rescue you in an instant and bring you home safely to the village of comfort 
and grace. Let us ask God to, to bless these words from John's gospel. And I'm also going to pray that God will prepare our hearts as we gather here for the Lord's table in communion. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for these comforting words. Uh, Jesus, you, you are so bigger, so much bigger than we think. You are not the infant sitting on his mother's lap. You are indeed Christos Pantocrat, or you are El Shaddai. You are the great I am. Fear not, I am with you. Lord, help us to cast all our fears and worries upon you. Your yoke is light, you are gentle and lowly, and you desire for us to cast all our concerns upon you. And Lord, as we look to communion today, those elements of the cup and the bread, Give us the memory of the day we were rescued, the moment we left the domain of darkness and we were transferred in an instant into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Help us to remember that and help us to remember how we look to the cross for our salvation and redemption. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please. Remain seated as the ushers come forward, wish to be the elements, but let's sing together as they do. Let's sing.
As I look here in John 6, uh, Jesus says, verse 35, I am the bread of life who comes to me, will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. I am the living bread that came out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. As you partake of the communion, not only think about Jesus, him being the bread of life, but also that bread of life was sacrificed on the cross. And if you eat of Jesus, the bread of life, he will raise you up on the last day. Let us partake of the bread in memory of his death. For my flesh is true food and my blood is the true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I am him. In. As the living Father sent me, I live because the Father, so he eats me. He also will live because of me. Think of the blood of Christ spilled on the cross, but that cup, was the cup of the new covenant. A covenant is irrevocable. If we participate of the cup of the blood of Jesus Christ, we in the covenant. And it says there, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Jesus will not change the game on you. But dear friends, you have to participate in this cup fully. Receive him fully. Uh, drink his blood fully. Let's partake of this cup of the new covenant, a memorial of the blood of Jesus Christ spilled for us on the cross. Lord, I thank you for your perfect sacrifice. Thank you that if we eat your flesh and drink your blood, we are in the internal covenant. You will bring us home safely. Thank you that you gave yourself, your body and your blood as a ransom and to rescue us from our sins. I thank you for your grace and your benevolence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together and echo Anton's prayer, giving thanks to our God for all that he's done in Christ Jesus. Let's sing. Oh, give thanks to the Father, spring of life, Lord of love, the bountiful fount of all provision. Come rejoice in his goodness, count each blessing that comes from heaven to earth, now from earth to heaven. Oh,
to Jesus, sing of his saving love, the bread of life from broken for redemption. How he carried the cross to make us daughters and sons, exalted now, King of our I want to leave you with, if you forgot everything I said, John 6, 20. I am, fear not. I am, fear not. May God bless you, and may he hold you with his right hand. Amen. Amen.